Uh, good morning, and it's so good to be together. Um, I'm so glad that we have air conditioning to warm the building and to make us feel warm. Um, but particularly, thank you for the warm welcome, um, all those that are here. Um, and we warmly welcome those who are joining us online, and especially at the moment. We're aware that for some people this is wise not for them to be here. We're so glad you can still be part of our service, um, and we'll be praying for you this morning. Um, and uh, if you are visiting us here this morning, just a few things that will help you know what's happening. Um, after the service, a few people are going to mingle out the back, and you're very welcome to hang around. A few people arriving for the second service might come early so that we can catch up with each other. Um, also, if you're looking for toilets, they're just around the back. Um, I'm not 100% certain I unlocked the door. Did anyone else unlock? I did. You did? Fantastic. Um, so, so the toilets are unlocked. You just go out the back there around the corner. Um, and you can do that, sneak out the, the back door if you need to. Um, we're going to uh, start this morning. I'm actually using in this service uh, some of the, uh, the prayer book. So uh, the Anglican Church has a prayer book. Um, and it has various prayers, but also an order of service. And I thought some of its words were particularly helpful. Um, so I'm going to read some of the, the parts of it as part of our service. And I'm going to open our service um, with a prayer from it. And at the right time, there'll actually be the prayer up on the screen. And I'd invite you to join in and uh, pray with me. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That's John 4, verse 24. We gather to, to worship God and we rely on him to give us the power to worship him rightly, to worship by his spirit. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of our, the Lord our God by following his laws, which he has set before us. We don't obey God, but he forgives Dear friends, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our many sins and not to conceal them in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father, but to confess them with a penitent and obedient heart so that we may be forgiven through his boundless goodness and mercy. We ought always humbly to admit our sins before God, but chiefly when we meet together to give thanks for the benefits we have received at his hands to offer the praise that is due him, to hear his holy word and to ask what is necessary for the body as well as for the soul. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of our glorious God as we pray together this prayer to start our time. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done. And we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a godly and obedient life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Uh, that last part is particularly our focus this morning, um, how we want to live a godly and obedient life to the glory of God's name, so that others will see. Um, but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ pardons and absolves all who truly repent and believe his holy gospel. For God desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he should turn from his wickedness and live. And he's given authority and commandment to his ministers to declare to his people, when they repent, the forgiveness of their sins. Therefore, let us ask him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that what we do now may please him and that the rest of our life may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been reminding ourselves of the gospel. We're going to sing it together now. I, tell, I love to tell the story of Jesus in his love. Why don't we stand and we'll sing it together.
from the Bible now and we have two readings. I'm afraid we don't have uh, Bibles to offer you but if you've got an app with the Bible in it um, or better yet a good old paper book um, then you could turn there. Um, Our first reading is Micah chapter 6 and Micah is one of the smaller books in the Old Testament. There's like 12 prophets and their messages are sort of in a row towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Micah is writing at the time when God's people have been split into two nations. There's the northern nation of Israel, the southern nation of Judah. And the northern nation has been warned that they've been disobeying God so long that he's going to have to destroy that nation. And the the judgment has come all the way into the very doors of Jerusalem. And Micah speaks to Jerusalem, warning them that even, even they really aren't living to please God. And he will act. And this is where he sort of puts his case to the people. What is my... Demands of you reasonable. What am I really looking for a nation and a people to be like? So have a listen to Micah 6. I'll start at verse 1. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the nations, mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. God's people thought they were pleasing him by sacrifices and rituals and a big show. And all he wanted was somebody who would be humble, do what's right and walk humbly before him, be in relationship with him. And so we come to Matthew 5, which is the passage we'll be focusing on. Uh, This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, and we've heard him just give the Beatitudes. He's talked about those who are blessed in the kingdom of God. And then he says to those who are listening, to his disciples, he says in verse 13, chapter 5, verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And Jesus is really clear. Um, God wants his people to be different and to stand out. And we're going to be reflecting on that later. Right now, though, um, we want to spend some time in prayer. Um, and I've got to find my prayer. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, give thanks for his providing for us. And uh, if you are regular, one of the ways we acknowledge his goodness is our offering, where we give money to allow the ministry of this church, our church family at Redlands, um, to keep continuing. Um, we're going to pray for members of our church family. Wilhelmina, just to update people, her, um, her crack, they say, I forget the grading and all those sorts of things, but basically it's not something they can operate on. Um, so she's currently doing OT and it should heal itself. Um, and so the aim is to help that heal. Um, it'll be probably two weeks. They're talking about in hospital getting treatment and exercise and, and then hopefully maybe after six weeks the treatment will be successful. Um, and the other thing is, uh, last week I think I misled people on Annette and her headaches. So let me just clarify, because um, I clarified during the week. Um, so it's not uh, uh, migraines. The, the condition is that the, she's got nerve endings in her brain that aren't, the casing doesn't quite work, so neuralgia is what they call it. Um, and she, her current medication reduces that pain, and the goal is to retrain the brain to handle this new situation. Um, and so the goal is to have six weeks without pain. At the moment, the med medication will allow about six days. Um, so we want to be praying that the medication keeps reducing the, the periods between the pain. Um, that's the, the big concern at the moment. Um, other than that, we should be praying for those who are now locked into nursing homes again, Deirdre and um, Les. Les was in good spirits. Um, uh, thankfully, his nursing home seems to be looking after him, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm sure Deirdre especially, she really feels the absence of seeing people and being in contact with people. So be praying for them and, and give a call and keep in contact where you can. Yeah. One last thing we're going to be praying for is QTC. Um, we try and focus once a year on our theological college as a denomination and be praying for its work. And they've got a video. Um, next week we're going to have Mark Badley, who's in our church, but he's one of the lecturers at the college. He's actually going to be preaching. But for this week, we might just watch a video to remind ourselves of what work they're doing and to hear from some of the students. Throughout time and throughout the nations, our brothers and sisters have been carrying out Christ's mission of taking the gospel to the world. Right now, it's our turn. God has acted in the gospel of the Lord Jesus to bring glory to himself. And we have the privilege of serving a humble, compassionate and righteous king. We don't expect it to be easy. We know the people of the world love the world, and the things of the world. The world is hostile to the gospel. Broken and corrupted by sin. Brought with pain and suffering. The recent pandemic can testify to that. But we also know that God commands all people everywhere to repent, because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Forgiveness from sin is freely available through Jesus, because of the extraordinary grace of God. Who might God place before you to share this gospel with? Uni students at Griffith and the Hebrew students at Spring Hill. Kids and youth in Singapore. Japanese people in Chiba City. Japanese people in Chiba City. University students in Cairns. A church family in Toowoomba. International students at the University of Queensland. Local church and community, Narrabri, New South Wales. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that drives us. That's where QDC comes in. We're here to prepare you to be able to take the gospel to the people that God puts in your life. This is why QTC exists. We train gospel-driven leaders for a challenging world. Praise God that people are continuing to train so that other people can know the hope of the gospel, know about Jesus. And why do we pray now? I'm going to start with some um, prayers from the order of service that I was using before. God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, hear the devout prayers of your church and grant that what we ask in faith we may surely obtain through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
of God, the author and lover of peace, in knowledge of whom stands our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, your servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that surely trusting in your defense, we may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you, through Jesus Christ, our son, your Son, our Lord. Father, we do ask for your ongoing work in our hearts and lives that we might live for you. We thank you for the hope we have in the gospel. Not merely that our broken relationship with you might be mended, but you invite us to be sons and daughters of your kingdom, to know our identity in Christ and to discover true love, love that you show us and love that you teach us to show each other. We pray you keep doing this work in our church family. We pray for our children's ministry uh, at the early church at 10.30 at Kapalabar, and we also pray for the children's work at Shore Hope. We thank you that there are many children coming, uh, both those who have grown up in Christian families and those who haven't. And we pray that through their time in those gatherings, they would learn more about Jesus and what it means to trust him. That they'd understand how holy you are, how your ways are right, and often we mistreat each other because of our sin and selfishness. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that they would come to know forgiveness because Jesus died on the cross. We ask not only that, we ask that they would learn to live for Christ, to live righteous lives as they submit to Jesus as their loving heavenly Lord now, that his resurrection life might empower them and transform them by the Spirit to be witnesses for you. Please be at work in them. Likewise, we pray for our home groups to be places where we open up the Bible and we read it together and you turn our lives around, that we might find new hope and a new vision for what it is to be human that it would really make a difference in how we live and that that difference would shine before others to your glory. We pray it would teach us to genuinely love our community and we pray for wisdom to find those opportunities to love the people we work with, the people we live with, and as a church community that we would keep looking for opportunities to love our community as participants in this society. Please keep teaching us what it is through our home groups to love and serve each other and to love and serve this world. We pray, Heavenly Father, for small businesses in our community during this time of financial hardship. We pray, Lord God, for those owners who are seeking to look after their employees and seeking to to keep afloat. Uh, We pray for them and for your kindness in this situation. We thank you for a government that is alert to the need to to support businesses. Um, Father, we pray that many small business owners might come to know the hope of Christ. No matter what their circumstance and what might happen to their business, their identity won't be tied up in its success, but in being loved by Christ and knowing he died to save them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be the ones who can share this hope in love through our friendships. And Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our college as we were reminded the way it trains men and women that they might go into the world so that your people might be found and encouraged. We thank you that they are clear on the gospel and ask that the college would remain firm to that truth. We pray for our denomination as it works out what the shape of the college should be into the future, that it might be a bold witness to Christ in itself and send out many to to testify and to love and serve your people. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would do this in humility, depending on you and your Spirit's work by your word. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be at work in us now as we turn to your word to learn more of Christ 
that you would encourage us and strengthen us by the power of your word and by the work of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to turn to the Bible now. Um, If you have a Bible with you, then please do open up to Matthew 5. The question we're sort of looking at is, what relationship should Christians have with the world as a whole? Um, So there's lots of opinions. Um, Some of the big ones in the past, many times in history, Christians have thought they really need to withdraw from the world. So very early on, there were monks that would go out into the desert and they'd live on their own. And eventually some of those uh, individuals formed monasteries and and other centres that were sort of Christian enclaves, separated from the world and um, living for God. Uh, that, then that's one way that the church has behaved. Other times the church has felt that it should be in charge. And so we have a history, especially in the West, where the church became a political player and tried to influence politics. It, it even made laws about how people should live. Uh, the church felt that it should be in charge because Jesus was king of the world. But in today's passage, the church isn't told to withdraw from the world because they're important for the world. And yet at the same time, they're not told to rule the world either. They're they're not in charge. They're told to stand out, to be different, so that God's attention, so that the world's attention will be drawn to God. So we're going to look at this. I'm going to have two headings, just the kingdom's impact and kingdom righteousness. That's what we're going to see in this passage. And then we'll, we'll reflect on what that means for us. But how about I pray? Heavenly Father, please help us to understand this passage and what it means for living for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so kingdom impact is where we start. Um, That's Jesus' agenda for his followers in this passage, to have an impact. So Jesus uses salt as an analogy. Uh, People have used lots of opinions about how Christians are to be like salt. Often we think of flavouring, that's our use of salt. Uh, Back in the times of Jesus, it wasn't as often about flavouring, it was about preserving. You had meats and the only way they stopped rotting in your cupboard, because there was no refrigeration, was to salt them. And so in many other ways, it was like an antiseptic, it was a cleaning device. And, And so people look at this Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth in this passage, and they assume they've got to choose one of those ways that salt affects the world. Um, how Jesus' followers affect the world like salt. And in, you know, some, in some senses, Christians, they, they are um, distinctive and they stand out like a flavour or um, they're, they're preserving in the society. We, Christians sometimes have, point people to, to good ways to live. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't actually draw any of those analogies in the passage. He simply talks about salt being salty. You can ask any small child, and they know the difference between sugar and salt. Salt has a unique flavour. And when a salt stops being salty, it's, it's useless, is Jesus' point. You throw it away. And likewise, Jesus expects his followers to be obvious. And if they're not clearly his followers, then they're not useful. So have a listen to what Jesus says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness... How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So Jesus compares salt to warn us that God has an intention for what Christians should be. Now, how do we know what this intention is? How are we supposed to be salty? We could go back. We could look at the Beatitudes. They paint a picture of who belongs in the kingdom. But we keep going forward because Jesus makes a similar point by comparing his followers to light. Like before, light is obvious. You only have to fly in a plane at night, don't you? And you look out the window and it's very easy to tell where the cities are and when you're looking over countryside. Much harder to tell if you're over the sea or over the earth, but the moment you pass over a city, bang. Because light is useful that it keeps things exposed. You don't light a lamp and hide it. And it stands out like a city on a hill. That's Jesus' point here in verse 14. I'll read it for you. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
So again, Jesus is saying his followers should be obvious and useful. They are to stand out because it's by standing out that they have the impact that God intends. And what is that obviousness? What should be seen? How should they be useful? That's in verse 16. They're useful when they draw attention to God. Verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So the comparison with salt and light is helpful because in both cases, the focus is in somewhere else, isn't it? Uh, When you add salt to a dish, you don't want people to pick it up and say, ooh, that's salty. You want them to taste all the other flavours. When you turn on the light, you don't then stare at the light. The light enables you to read the book or to to do the the, the sewing or whatever it is that you're doing. And likewise here, our good deeds aren't intended to draw attention to us, but to God. That's a certain type of being good, isn't it? That's not a doing good to be seen by others. It's a doing good because... You care about others. It's not a doing good that draws attention to itself and promotes itself like, you know, letting people know how many charities you support in an area. It's when you do it out of a longing for God and there's a humility and a meekness, a lot like what the Beatitudes were talking about. Just some thoughts on how we do that. Uh, It means that in order to glorify God and have Jesus, God get the honour... We probably need to be talking about him at some stage, don't we? It's not enough to be known as a good person. People need to know that we do it out of a love for Jesus. Um, There's this old uh, quote that people love. Apparently, people reckon it's from St. Francis, though there's no evidence that it was St. Francis. Um, But it goes, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. And I guess what I'd say in this passage is, it's saying the words are always necessary. There always needs to be, alongside of a life lived for God and good things being done, a a tongue that just loves talking about our Heavenly Father, that loves to point others to Him. But notice also that it happens when we, we be what we are. So, as in, it's not a focus on doing good works, but being people who long for God's kingdom. We want God's way of living so much. We think his way is so good that that we're pursuing it and we live it. And that means that our life does stand out. We we do things to care for other people. But it's shaped by our longing to be in heaven, to be with God. Our love of what his world is like. That's actually what's driving a life where the good works bring glory to the heavenly father. I was thinking about my family. At the moment, our family longs to go to Japan. I have some long service leave coming up, and so we're diligently putting away holiday money, thinking that maybe in a couple of years um, we might be able to do that trip. But the other thing that's happening is that our family is learning Japanese. So my kids are learning Japanese at school. Um, Jocelyn started learning Japanese on an app at home. I'm the odd one out, I have to confess. I have not actually put any effort in so far. But if they want to visit Japan, then they start to live in anticipation of it. Their life starts to get shaped by it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. This is why this pass flows out of the Beatitudes. As you hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God, for a righteous world, your good deeds should show. And they should show to God's glory. They show where your heart is going. And how can we sort of teach ourselves what this righteousness looks like? Well, Jesus says the place to go is the law and the prophets because the law and the prophets describe kingdom righteousness. Okay, and that's the next part of Jesus' passage. It must have been amazing to see Jesus' ministry because he taught in such a way, right, that Jesus is aware people might think he was denying the law. He taught in such a way that, that he had to turn around and say to people, you know what, I'm not here to abolish the law. Because they're hearing grace and mercy and they're thinking, is he saying we don't have to keep the law? But Jesus says, no, 
I am on about what the law is on about. My goal is its goal. What the law and the prophets tried to accomplish, I'm going to achieve. Listen to verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest, jo- sorry, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now that can be really confusing, can't it? Uh, because in the New Testament, in many places, and especially in Paul's letters, um, uh, at times they, people seem to reject the law. But we've got to listen carefully to what's going on in those places. What's rejected is a particular use of the law. So um, using the law to get righteousness. Um, we've got Galatians 2 verse 21 here. Uh, Paul says to this letter to a church in Galatia. Galatia is in um, what we call Eastern Turkey. Um, Galatians 2 verse 21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So people are believing that if they use the law, they're going to get the righteousness that God wants. And Paul says, no, you need grace. You need Jesus to be right with God. You see it again in Romans 10 verse 4. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. It's not that Christ put aside the law, It's just that you won't be able to use the law to be righteous. And this is where it's really helpful to realise the name the Jews used for their Bible, um, Bible just means book, it's a Latin term, the name they would often use is the law and the prophets, or the law and the prophets and the writings. And so when Jesus talks about don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's not just referring to the the rules that came down at Mount Sinai or the the set of instructions. He's talking about the whole, what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. Uh, Jesus talks in this way in other places. So Luke 24, Jesus says, uh, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, he's referring across the whole of their, Old Test- well, their scriptures, our Old Testament. Um, Matthew 7, verse 12. Do what others would have do to you, sorry, what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Again, Jesus is referring back to the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Or you've got Matthew 22, verse 40. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands, to love your neighbour and love yourself. So this is when Jesus here in um, Matthew 5 talks about the law and the prophets and fulfilling that, he's not just talking about a set of rules, but the whole story of God's people. The story of him building, rescuing them from Egypt, wanting a people that were dedicated to him, living in obedience to him, and yet constantly failing. And so he judged them. He he sent them into exile and he promised that one day a a, a Messiah would come that would rescue them, would restore them so that they could live righteous lives. We heard that in Micah, didn't we? Did you think I was on about all those sacrifices? I'm on about someone who will walk humbly before me and do what is just and right. And so any teaching less than that Anything that, that calls for less than genuine, heartfelt obedience to God, that belongs to hell, says Jesus in verse 19. Have a listen. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We're going to hear more about how the Pharisees related to the law as Jesus goes on. Uh, You know, the next section is full of Jesus saying, you have heard it said by the Pharisees, but I say to you, 
And Jesus takes up the Old Testament and he gives us the, the right sense of it. For example, murder is about far more than murder. And that's the righteousness that Jesus is here to fulfill. So I'm not going to fully unpack that in verse 20. For today, what I want us to see is that what the law and the prophets taught was righteousness. What Jesus came to fulfill was righteousness. And so what we should long for, the goal of our trust in Jesus, what will make us salt and light for this world, is kingdom righteousness. It's longing for a right relationship with God. What did God save us for? Did he save us so we go and hide in a corner and be a Christian community on our own? No. Did he save us so that we would take charge and and defeat the kingdoms of this world and become a, a world ruled by a Christian government? No. He saved us so that we would long for and live for kingdom righteousness, that we might be distinct as followers of Jesus. And that is challenging. And you can feel sometimes the gap between what God says and the way many people who call themselves followers of Jesus actually live. And I think this is a really, really challenging passage. I think we hear it and we think of evangelism, but we don't think of the life that sits behind the evangelism, the call to love God's law and his word, to listen to the Bible humbly and to walk before him. The thing is that when you have a different culture, if you belong to a different place, you stand out. Uh, I remember when I was uh, young, um, I was doing some study and someone paid for me to go to Sweden And I spent a a few months working and living there. And no matter how much I looked similar to the people in that community, I had similar skin colour, lots of Europeans, various descent. I've sort of got a European background. I could look similar, but what I did and said just kept standing out. (laughs) I I see for some reason wanted milk in my coffee and that just was never in the the, um, fridge at the workplace I was at. (laughs) I'd refer to my, my lecturer by his first name, not, not just by his first name, I'd use nicknames. I talked about Bob, and everyone would have to take a while to work out, you're talking about Professor Newell? <laughs> because I came from a different culture. People who follow Jesus aren't different because of their accent or because of the food that we eat. What mark, should mark us out as different is hungering and thirsting for righteousness mourning over our sin, having a relationship with God that makes us meek, loving purity, and looking to Jesus to offer the forgiveness that we should have. How about I pray? Heavenly Father, help us to wrestle what it means to live for Jesus. Uh, We come knowing how often we say that we want to follow you but people see a very different thing in our lives. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to do that heart work that teaches us to engage with you and to long for what you long for, to seek your kingdom and to allow our lives to be different, that it might point to you. Help us to do this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got a closing song. Um, and uh, I can't remember what it is. Fight the good fight. So a call to live...
I'm going to pray and then we'll have the benediction song as we close. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have given us grace to bring before you with one accord our common supplications. And you promise that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, that Lord, the desires and petitions of your servants, as may, be, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.